started. People will slowly trickle in as they come. My name is Charlotte and I'm from the Tech Nation team and I want to welcome you to diversity and meaningful mentorship session. I have some great panelists here today and uh, I'd love to introduce our moderator. Uh, her name is Leah Nord. Uh, she is the senior director for strategies and exclusive growth sorry, at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. I'll pass it over to you, Leah. Thanks very much, Charlotte. And I'm looking at time differences here. Good morning, good late morning to some of you across the country and, and different stages of the afternoon. I am delighted to be here this afternoon. Caught the, the panel just before, had to leave a little early, unfortunately, but was making a list of, of, of great words around skilling and upskilling. And, and now we're going to turn our attention to mentorship, but not only mentorship, but uh, diversity and meaningful mentorship. Uh, as uh, Charlotte said, we have a very uh, distinguished panel here this afternoon, and we actually were talking earlier about how this uh, mentorship panel could be a conference in and of itself, and, and so could even every single one of these questions. So uh, I'm going to keep it short on the intros. and. You know, just do a little tour de table here to start before we jump into to questions and ask each of the speakers here this afternoon to, to introduce themselves, their organization, and a little bit about what they do. So, Chantelle, I'm going to start with you this afternoon and, and, and give you the floor for a, an introduction. Thank you, Leah. Uh, my name is Chantelle Slater Shaw. I am a senior director at Rogers. I support the HR and corporate organizations there. So we do um, project delivery and operational support for our core businesses. Um, I've been at Rogers over 20 years, but been in the industry um, to over 25 years in both the telecommunications and uh, shipping industry. I am married mother of one and um, just started university in September in this virtual world. So working on those challenges. And um, I, I uh, do genealogical research, sorry, genealogical research in my spare time as well as spend a lot of time with my family. That's wonderful, Chantel, thanks very much. Uh, Wayne, I'm gonna give the floor to you for an introduction here as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lee. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is Wayne Prabhu. Um, I am a serial entrepreneur uh, based here in Toronto. Um, uh, my uh, wife and I last summer uh, started a not-for-profit with the help of 50 corporations uh, and a management consulting company. And uh, the Onyx Initiative is focused on helping college and university students uh, find placements and internships uh, in, in corporate Canada. Um, the initiative is self-funding, uh, which we're very excited about and comes back from my entrepreneurial sort of days. Um, but uh, we launched on October, October 21st and uh, we're really excited about the progress. Wonderful, Wayne, thanks. And before we jump into questions here. Dennis, I'm going to give the floor to you for an introduction as well. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dennis Kerrigan. I have two names, the one and the French one. I'm talking today from the Niganit Urban Reserve in the north part of Regina, Saskatchewan, Treaty 4 territory. And I'm uh, president of a company called Plato Testing. Uh, general manager, CEO of a different company, related company called Plato Craft Testing. Uh, together, what we're doing is uh, working to bring uh, more Indigenous Canadians into careers in information technology using software testing and quality assurance as sort of the bridge uh, for into uh, careers. Uh, we have a college accredited uh, training program that we established back in 19 or 2015. And uh, we have uh, just, just celebrated our fifth year of business in Canada. So. We're quite excited about that. Um, and we're really working to bring more uh, Indigenous Canadians into careers in information technology and sort of setting up a vanguard of uh, folks who are first in, and uh, we know that others will follow. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Dennis or Denise, as the case, Denis, as the case may be. 
Uh, so I'm going to open the floor to some questions here and hopefully leave some uh, time for questions as well. People can can insert through the chat or through the Q&A. And to jump right into it, Chantal, I'm going to start with you here with the first question. Um, and to preface it, it is the, the, the statement that research from Cornell University's School of Industrial and Labor Relations show that mentoring programs dramatically improve promotion and retention rates for minorities and women by 15 and 38 percent respectively, compared with non-mentor employees. Um, what is the recipe for a meaningful and successful mentorship, especially for uh, Black or Indigenous mentees? And how can we work to mitigate uh, negative mentorship experiences? I know there's a lot to parse out there, but if you could start, we'd really appreciate it. Sure. Thanks, Leah. Um, successful mentorship, uh, good question. I think we need to make sure that participants, whether it's the mentee or the mentor, are open and honest and transparent, and most importantly, willing to learn. Um, the mentorship relationship, I feel, that gives an opportunity for both the mentees, for the mentee to learn about the experiences of the mentor, to share on some of the mistakes, some of the things that worked, some of the things that didn't work. But I think it's also an opportunity for the mentor to learn a different perspective, whether it's from from an ethnic perspective or an educational perspective, they they need to learn. One part of the question you mentioned is uh, a productive um, a mentorship relationship. We also have to recognize that um, not all mentor mentorship mentor mentor mentee relationships will work. And not, not all the time you'll get what you're looking for from that relationship. So you need to be, I would say, brave enough to ensure that you say to the mentor, hey, I'm not, I'm not getting what I'm looking for in this relationship. So, you know, can we part our company and, and move on? I think it is important for that open and honest conversation to happen to make sure that both people are getting what they need from the relationship. Thanks, Chantel. Thanks, and that 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 openness and honesty is 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 no is undoubtedly key in both directions. Wayne, I'm going to ask if you'd like to add anything um, from your experiences to date, um, as as you yeah, started I, out here on on your adventure. And then Dennis, if you want to join in after that, that would be great. Yeah, I, I have two comments. One, um, the data point. There's a stark difference between minorities and women in the data at 15 and 38%. Um, and I think that that's worth calling out that uh, it's not as effective for minorities. Um, there is, uh, we uh, at Onyx believe part of the problem is that there, and I think we, uh, we conflate the terms coaching and mentorship in a lot of situations. And I think Chantal started to hint on that. Um, minorities, uh, need a real intervention. They need coaching. Um, and they come from a very different life experience. Um, and because of that, just mentorship or guiding their career process is not enough. Um, and our program at Onyx is really focused on, on a, on a two phase approach. One is coaching uh, those students and helping them with the soft skills that are going to make them successful. And then pairing up with professionals from a mentoring standpoint, they're going to help them uh, guide their professional careers. Those are two very different things. And I think they often get conflated, uh, which is okay if the life experience of the mentor and the mentee are the same. But if they're not the same, whether they're Indigenous or, uh, or Black or other minority groups, we found that mentorship fails um, because you're not able to give the right guidance. Um, we believe that there are certain demographics that the current mentorship programs just don't work for and require an intervention because of the life experiences uh, of those mentees. Um, so, Dennis, go yeah, ahead. Thank you, sir. I was waiting for an introduction and I think I was supposed to talk. Um, the, uh, the interesting, it's an interesting question and it's one that I struggled with just in our, in our cone context because uh, Plato testing really was designed and built to be uh, a, a vehicle for bringing Indigenous people into uh, careers in technology. And the reason we saw that as necessary is because if we look at even the graduates of universities or colleges, 
uh, and try and uh, source uh, or determine how many indigenous graduates there are, uh, the best that we can come up with is that there aren't very many and, and there needs to be more. Um, so what we did is, is really uh, focused on a couple of things. And in my own experience, uh, which has been working with the government of Canada as, uh, in various uh, leadership positions there, and I'm an Indigenous person myself, is that the best recruiters for businesses in terms of bringing in Indigenous people are other Indigenous people. Um, because we, we tend to operate and live and, and talk in communities, and if we learn that there's a place to work that's a good place to work and it's supportive and there's other people like us there, chances are you're going to find us working there. So um, we uh, what we've done here is really try to... Uh, uh, cover off a couple of points. I know Wayne mentioned sort of the, the training, the technical aspect of training and the professional side of being a software tester. We try to provide that in our course. Uh, we, we, we train in groups, which is important because, uh, you know, we have people that are learning together. They develop sort of that team com camaraderie and the, all the, you know, the functions of, uh, I guess, becoming a team, all the stages. Um, and then we tend to hire as a group. So anyone who's successful in our program, we bring in. So if 15 people out of 15 are successful, 15 out of 15 start and enter the workforce with the same employer um, as sort of and have a ready-made network inside of the business. And uh, then when it comes to having those people, um, that's I guess when when the mentorship really uh, starts to bloom because what we do is is we try to where possible uh, with engagements with uh, client organizations is place in groups of, of you know at least two if we can, and if possible support that through a more senior technical person who is usually non-indigenous. Uh, maybe a racialized person, maybe not, but really try to focus on the technical part of it to build success because really what we're trying to do is create aut autonomous individuals, people who are uh, have the confidence to succeed um, and that you find that that usually comes through experience. And uh, so our goal really is to develop the skills needed to be successful for the first year, support the individuals for the first and second year of employment. And then from that, um, we find people that are you know able to succeed projects by themselves because they have both the training and uh, a little bit of uh, miles under the tires, I guess, to be and, and the confidence to be successful. Yeah, and we'll tease this out a little bit more because you sort of see this, you know, continuum, right? Skills development, the coaching, the mentoring, and even, you know, I don't know if we'll get to it today, but sponsorship is as well. Um, and Dennis, I know you just finished, but when I you know, broach this this next question. I, I'm going to direct it a bit to you, and hopefully, it might pick up on some of Wayne's points as well about differentiation. Uh, again, beginning with a statement that the Harvard Business a Harvard Business School study showed that Black post secondary graduates were more likely than their white peers to be formally assigned a mentor. However, having said that, they derived less value from those relationships, and it was uh, more effective to have a senior uh, executives, uh, either white or minority, connect with them more naturally over uh, through common interests or, or work groups. The point being that you know sometimes diversity initiatives are well-meaning but but fall short. So um, Dennis, while some leaders may or may not have support, understanding, and resources for their workplace to develop their mentorship practices or hold other managers or mentors accountable. What can these leaders do to ensure that the mentorship that they are providing, uh, you know, in your case, to an Indigenous uh, employees and participants is, is culturally appropriate? Thanks. Um, thanks, uh, Leah. A couple of things. I guess the first comment is that um, I think one doesn't have to wait for permission to be um, a good manager or to, to seek to try to change something and be a leader inside of their organization. So that's, uh, I guess, the first point. When it comes to dealing with people that, uh, and, and actually in our business, we get this question a lot, um, why, where are the boundaries, right? We've got uh, you know, a, a junior uh, tester who's from, uh, you know, maybe from a reserve community, maybe grew up in the city, but they're different. And um, I, I, will, I do a lot of coaching and mentoring of, of managers and leaders who are non-Indigenous, who have little to no experience working with Indigenous people. And they ask me the question, how do I approach this? And my question is really, well, ask. You know, ask a question. Um, one of the things that we have as a as a culture primarily is, if somebody's asking a question of us, they're giving us the honor of giving a response. Number one, and number two, if the question is asked in, in earnestness and honestly, um, even if the question is not the right question to ask, um, 
we give sort of the latitude of people not knowing, right? You get to, you get to be dumb for, for lack of a better way of saying it. And that allows us to you know, provide a, a response back. And, and through that response and through that interaction, you get the development of a relationship. And I think that's probably the most important thing when it comes to developing a, uh, a mentorship sort of relationship or a coaching relationship with an Indigenous employee is that you have to find a, uh, some common ground, create some trust at an individual level. And once that trust is, is created, then you can get into, I think, some of the, uh, you know, the more technical aspects of, you know, here's things that you should, you know, do as a, as an employer, here's things that might help with your career. But quite often with uh, people like me, and maybe I'm speaking too much from a personal level, uh, that little bit of trust is important first before uh, I will start to divulge, divulge things that, um, you know, I hold dear to me, because especially if there's a, a bit of vulnerability there. And keep doing it, please. I actually appreciate the personal aspect. It's it's the real world that that, that brings it to life, and this trust theme keeps um, coming forward. Um, Wayne and, and Chantal, I'll ask you uh, if you'd like to add to that as well. And and Wayne, maybe we'll start with you. Thanks. Um, you know, I I, I just left uh, AT and T, where as a senior VP there uh, for the last four years, and one of the things that we did uh, was to expose our black talent to our executives. Um, and so I agree with the article. It did two fundamental things. It gave a lot of our uh, black talent uh, from across the country, we would fly them in uh, for our sessions with our, our senior executives. And one of the big things that it did, it was it gave them confidence to be able to be in that audience. Um, they the One of the fundamental things that as a black executive, you have to get real comfortable with is the fact that you're black because you're typically going to be the only one in the boardroom. And this is one of those life experiences that our white counterparts have not, uh, have not experienced. Uh, and when I talk about how you, we need to coach differently, this is one of the conditions that minorities have to deal with and they have to get super comfortable um, with or else they're not going to be successful. And so bringing, uh, you know, black uh, talent to, uh, in social context to meet with our executives um, and to talk about themselves and get comfortable in that situation helps a lot. And the other thing that it does is it really uh, sends a message to the rest of the company that our, our executives actually care about our black talent and that gets amplified throughout the whole organization. Um, so it's a very, very different experience uh, when you feel like you belong uh, in an organization as a minority. Um, and that sense of belonging, um, I think a lot of folks are working on diversity, you know, but uh, the, real, uh, the real test and why we need mentorship is to create that sense of belonging. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. Uh, I think that, you know, when you look at um, executives, and unfortunately, in a lot of our companies, we don't necessarily have a lot of black executives, but I think, you know, having the young people meet with the executives, irrespective of what their ethnic background is, gives them a sense of one different perspectives, because you can share your experiences as you as a minority leader and how you got there. Um, to for any minority groups that are, do attend these sessions, they can see that, yes, this company does have uh, some sort of diversity, although in some cases it's one black person, but some sort of diversity in their organization. And secondly, I think that it also allows um, non-BIPOC individuals to have conversations with those, um, with those leaders and understand how they got there. Um, and the journey sometimes is very different, right? The experiences, the journey is very different. And I think it gives them a lot of just exposure on, on, on what the executives had to go through in order to get there. Yeah, if I would add, I think Chantal, that's kind of the number one question I get is, you know, what was it like to be a black CEO? What was it like to be a black executive? Yeah. And that's kind of the number that's one true. question. Um, that I get um, in mentoring students today, black students, um, because it is not something that they can discuss at the dinner table. A lot of them are first generation university graduates. Um, they can't, as much as their parents 
could try and give them for some perspective. It's not ex perspective from experience. Um, and this lack of social capital is one of the big issues that are hurting a number of communities in Canada. Yeah, no, yeah true. I mentor um, uh, Black women at Rogers as part of our RISE program, and that is one of the fundamental things we talk about in every session, that they just don't have enough exposure to Black um, leaders in order to get their perspective. They do have mentorship programs, and they, as a, as, as a result, this year, some people took the initiative to make to seeking out a, a person in the BIPOC community for mentorship to learn from that experience because they found that some of their other mentors in past years could not they couldn't relate to the journeys that they saw as a, you mentioned as an immigrant um, into Canada or you know somebody that's first generation um, college graduate so definitely agree that we do need that diversity at that leadership level to ensure we can share those experiences and encourage other people to move up the professional ladder. Thanks. One of the things we're doing for our corporate partners at Onyx is we're actually building a mentorship training program mm -hmm. for this particular demographic. Okay. Um, so that they have a better expectation of the life experiences. We don't believe that all of the mentors, we have 170 students in our program. We don't believe that all of them should have black mentors. We don't believe that's healthy but they should have an understanding of the life experiences of what these these students and, and um, scholars have been through um, to be able to effectively mentor them. So we're going to put together a program for mentors for this particular demographic. That's great. Yeah, and Wayne, I have to say that's fantastic from, you know, even where I sit at the Canadian Chamber. We're going to take this question from a different angle, but pointing out for for you know, in this space for so many reasons and so many, you know, coming from so many angles, um, individuals and businesses are afraid to even dip their toe in the water, right? They don't know where to start. They're afraid of doing something wrong. So, so something like that would just help move the needle and bring people along, you know, because you could, whether you don't know how, or even if you have good intentions, right, how, how to bring that, that forward, um, is that is um is just critical and again i know this takes it from another angle but wayne this question's coming to you i don't think that'll come as a surprise from our previous discussions but but for leaders uh who either aren't getting support or have limited organizational resources from their organization for a whole host of reasons how can they lead cultural change themselves from within thanks I think the first thing, and you know, I've, I've spoken to a number of the CEOs across Canada that have signed up for our program, and um, I, the first thing I, I'd like to say is across the board, every one of them says diversity and inclusion is good business. Um, and my point is, if you don't build a diverse and inclusive workforce, your business is dead. It's not going to survive. Um, that's the, you know, at the, at the, that's the first point that I think uh, needs to be stated. The next thing I think um, is leaders have to be empathetic. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion about being an empathetic leader. Um, but this idea of putting yourself in someone else's shoes, I think we've gone through a number of years where we've been taught to be tolerant of other, uh, um, of other cultures, um, of other people. Tolerance is not enough. Um, and I think we, we have to move beyond tolerance as, as, as Canadians and, and really strive to be empathetic. Uh, empathetic in everything we do. Um, you know, what you'll hear, one of the big drivers of corporations around the world is this customer empathy. Um, you know, we need to extend that to our neighbors and we need to extend that to communities that we normally would not uh, interact with uh, to understand what walking in their shoes is like in order for us to uh, come together as a community. So I would encourage leaders to be more empathetic, get out of their, their social norms um, and expand and understand other people. Uh, one of the blessings that I've had in my life is I've spent 30 years on the road in 50 different countries. Um, and I've learned to be black 
in, you know, in all kinds of situations. And I've learned that, you know, everybody's the same. Everybody's, you know, striving to do the same things. And most people are not trying to kill you or they're not malicious. Um, so I encourage everybody, take the opportunity, learn about other cultures, uh, become empathetic. Uh, and, and I think if we have a more empathetic nation, more empathetic leaders, we, we, can, we can solve this problem. Thanks so much, Wayne. Dennis, do you want to build off of that at all? I don't think I could have could say it any better, um, but certainly something I've had from my own experience is that leadership really happens at the individual level. And I think I mentioned it before, you don't wait for somebody to tell you you can do it. Um, taking the time to get to know the people that you work with is an important thing. And um, I, I think something for dealing with Indigenous uh, employees especially is that, uh, you, you know, the, the, the experience of our, of our peoples across Canada is different, but there's some common threads to it. And coming into organizations very much, there's that sort of outsider coming in kind of a, a perception, right? And then, you know, the imposter syndrome is, is uh, quite, quite often elevated. Um, the something that I think is useful, and, and I, I, I think it's probably useful regardless of a person's uh, uh, ethnic heritage, is, is really uh, the Wayne uh, talks about and the feeling that who you are as an individual is is important, right? So uh, something that I've seen just in, in the work that we do, uh, you know, we have a lot of people who have little to no experience working in a professional environment. All of a sudden they go to a training program, they're hired, they're working with uh, a technology specialist in Los Angeles, California, and they're sitting in Northern New Brunswick and they're from a Mi'kmaq community. And over time, um, the relationship develops between our resource and the client's person in, in California. Um, work, we find that working with American companies is great because they're used to outsourcing, so they don't really care, uh, you know, where you're from, uh, you know, uh, sort of what you do after hours. They care about are you competent, do you meet deadlines, uh, are you cost effective, and if the answer to those questions is yes, they they like you, right? And the fact that we're on the same time zones and all kinds of things helps. But the experience that we've found uh, in our organization is that. Uh, when people realize that, hey, I get to be Mi'kmaq, I get to do whatever I do culturally on the weekend. During the work hours, here I am, I'm working with people who value who I am that, you know, I would not, not otherwise know uh, or work with. Um, there's a confidence that, that comes up in the individual employee. And I think it's, from my perspective, it's that confidence that we want to want to nurture. And and because that will be um, the tool that that individual will have that will carry them through to subsequent levels of either, you know, if they get to, into a more technical uh, leadership uh, capacity or if they're like a business leader or, you know, uh, into, you know, managing and supervising teams themselves. That's an important thing to foster. And I think that the more that individual uh, managers and leaders and, and even team leaders inside of organizations can develop that at an individual level, it's a skill that will carry forward and pay dividends uh, going forward. Thanks, Dennis. I really do appreciate that and the idea of not sitting around to wait, right? Taking your own initiative, even, you know, again, a reoccurring theme is the braveness in, in that context as well. Um, Chantal, I do want to give you the opportunity to comment on this question as well before I, I heads up, put you on the spot for the next one. Yeah, sure. The, um, I completely agree with what Dennis and, and Wayne said. I think it does take a certain level of bravery to start that conversation yourself. Um, yes, you may not have the support of the organization, but you know you need to, to identify opportunities that you can speak about. I know in, in Rogers, uh, after the murder of George Floyd, there was really a reckoning within the company and, and some very real conversations started. And one of the things my leadership offered me the opportunity to host a town hall to talk about my experiences um, uh, my racist experiences within inside, inside the company and outside the company, and just to share with everybody in the company that you know it really affects the, your the person that shows up to work every day. Your life, your your lived experiences shows that, and it afforded an opportunity to start a conversation for other people within the organization, quite frankly, to share their experiences and how you know the the what's happening in society affects them. So I think, but it takes a certain level of bravery to start that conversation and then back to the empathy conversation. And one of the things we took the opportunity of doing is to educate people about what systemic racism looks like 
in everybody's life? What does what does marginalization looks like? What does microaggressions look like? And and that started um, allow people to be more comfortable in having the conversation. And as such, we have done um, quite a number of things within the company just just because of that one conversation, that one person that was brave to put something on our um, so an internal social media to talk about that event. So it, it, it really takes bravery to, to, to um, start that. And we do want to encourage people to learn about what it is when somebody says um, anti-black racism or anti-indigenous racism, what it actually means and how that affects the individuals that show up to work every day. Chantel, thanks so, so much for that and, and sharing that story. You know, you think of, you know, a, a larger corporation and, and where this goes and where it gets you know what happens but it's it's how it gets triggered that's that's fascinating and panelists just so you know because we are on that topic i'm going to skip uh and, and come to the the question that's topical and then go back to another one here but but chantelle you did speak about this and and wayne it was interesting what you were saying before about the whole diversity piece right because even i would have said you know when before the crisis it, you know it was such a given and i know we have a lot of ways to go to move that mark right but diversity isn't you know the smart thing to do or the right thing to do it's it's the only thing to do right and, and, and when we took a look at workforce issues before the crisis i mean the crisis has put a, a context over it but it's it's more than just the pandemic i would say in the past year right it's it's movements like black force uh, black lives matter it's it's what happened you know last week in atlanta and and the reverberations here among the the asian canadian communities it's it's things like you know there is a real um you know, increasing focus on ESG as well. And, and, and I just sort of opened the floor to comments. I know things have changed and they haven't, but where, where are some pockets? Like what has changed in the past year? And, and where are some pockets of, you know, great practice, but, but also where are some areas of, of development? And, and again, I know that that puts uh, a few of us on the spot here, but Wayne, maybe I'll, I'll start with you for that question. Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, obviously we've opened the aperture to the issue. So, you know, a lot more people understand the issue. I think a lot more people are talking about the issue. Um, really happy to be able to have an audience to, you know, give, give our views. We've done a lot of research um, about um, what the impact is on, on Canada and this particular demographic. And, you know, we are trying to be um, a data-driven organization and trying to uh, build up, uh, um, you know, come up with a solution. I don't think a lot, like our organization, um, without that kind of attention, uh, I think it would have been hard to start, to be honest with you. I think our organization, some of the other initiatives that we've seen in Canada, like the Black, uh, Black North Initiative, a number of initiatives that that have happened. Um, I don't know that uh, Canadians uh, would have felt that this was something happening uh, in our community. Um, I think it was something that we always felt was south of the border. And for some reason, there is a force field protecting Canada um, that, uh, you know, for a number of us, we can tell you it really doesn't exist. Um, and so I think the, the most important thing that happened uh, over the last year, I think, is that we're having these these dialogues. And, and you know, I've been uh, really, you know, it's really heartwarming to see how many uh, corporate Canadians really want to make a, uh, a difference. Um, and I apologize to all the folks who are in government. And, you know, I'm a I'm a. Uh, I just think it has to be something driven by corporations. Um, I think the government has tried and they've tried different programs and, but I just don't, I just think you have to, you have to have the, um, the private sector uh, drive this uh, similar to, you know, what, what, what they've done along the lines of gender. Um, I think, you know, they've made progress. We're not there on gender, but we've made good progress. And so I think that, you know, opening up these issues to the private sector, um, opening up the after, open up the discussion. Um, we are, we're fortunate in that we have 50 of Canada's biggest companies that are participating in this with us. 
Um, we're still working on Raju Shanta, but we're, um, uh, you know, we're, we're very, very excited about it. I don't know that without some of the things that happened south of the border, we would have been able to, to do that. Dennis Chantel, would you like to add anything to that? Um, yeah, yes, Wayne, we're, we're still a work in progress, that's for sure. I completely agree. We, we, I personally believe that a lot of good conversation has happened, but I think we need to see a little bit more action, like tangible actions um, in our recruitment processes as an example. So I know that, you know, Rogers as an example has a partnership with BPTN to kind of um, increase the black representation in our pipeline into technology, but we now need to see, you know, confirmation of hiring um, resources based on that partnership. So lots of good conversation, but we, we really need to to get to the action part of the of the movement. Um, I think that there are a lot of things that corporations um, can do, and uh, I was watching a TED talk the other day, and somebody talked about being color brave i think that's what we need people need to be you know if you want to get a diverse set of candidates for your posting and you do not get it you need to repost you just don't say oh this is what i got so let me you know choose somebody from this group if you're looking for a certain level of representation and you don't get it in the in the application process then look at who you're targeting are you going into the right schools are you going to the bipoc groups at the university campus and you're recruiting actively recruiting intentionally recruiting from those groups into the organization not just sitting aside and saying oh well nobody applies or the right people i didn't get the right people so let me just go ahead with what i have we need to be very intentional in our recruitment and i think that's where companies need to focus thanks chantel and that yeah that's chantel, a great I, I i would uh, i would amplify that yeah i would amplify that i mean some of the corporations we're we're recruiting from and, and denny you'll get a you'll understand this. They only recruit from one or two universities. And so, you know, if you're, you know, and we know that these, you know, whether you're indigenous or black tend to cluster at universities. And if that university is not included in the recruiting process for that corporation, there is no way that they're going to get, they're going to get an offer. Um, they're not going to see an offer. Um, so there's a, there's a number of systemic things that we got to break out of the habit of. And I'm in tech and, you know, one of the big tech companies we spoke to only recruits from Waterloo. Well, Waterloo doesn't have a very diverse population. So you're not going to get a, a very diverse recruit. Um, yes, thank you. And, and our experience, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, um, I guess, parallels or similarities uh, to, to a certain degree um, with the indigenous experience in Canada. And there's a history that's all of our own, right? Um, but what we've seen has been very positive just in the last number of years is is really the take up of uh, the concept of, of Plato testing. It, you know, first of all, I think it was sort of a, a curiosity. Wow, there's a company that's training, um, you know, Indigenous Canadians to be software testers. So first of all, the question is, what is software testing? Because a lot of places have it in existing contracts and then it gets sent offshore to somewhere else and not to be done by some other countries' uh, workforce. Um, but we we found just in the last year that we know we now have uh, partnerships across Canada and there is a great deal of interest uh, on the part of corporate Canada especially to say okay well you know how can we help you um, expand your workforce because ultimately if there are more uh, again more diverse uh, workforce more indigenous Canadians in the workforce that helps us all as Canadians there's the social impact side of it but there's also the supply side of it right uh, the more people that we have working in this space um, so one of the things that's really happened, uh, and you talk about sort of, uh, we've had people that ostensibly are our are, 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 um, competition come to us and say, would you partner with us? Uh, we're, you know, we're, we're bidding on a contract with, in many cases, a provincial government or a large corporation. And, you know, there's some benefit to having an Indigenous partner there. And then we go in as the QA or testing partner for that. And we've actually had uh, one of the largest consulting companies, international consulting companies, approach us about formalizing a partnership whereby, you know, they have there across uh, all industry verticals, government, uh, you know, uh, international business, corporate business in Canada, and they can supply the work that we need to actually grow our, our, our company across Canada. 
Uh, because ultimately what we're trying to do is to build a for-profit company that is sustainable because the only way we'll get the, the corporate or the, the societal change and, and the, uh, the impact that we want is if we have a company that's sustainable. And um, so far, uh, you know, we're have made it through a, 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 or making it through a pandemic and business has grown. And that's been largely because of the desire, we believe, of corporate Canada um, to actually work uh, work with a company that's having an impact for Canada. So that's been very, very positive. Thanks, Dennis. And I love that story of sort of stronger together, right? Or partnering and, and, and collaboration. And, and of course, uh, inevitably, we're going to run out of time here. But I think that does touch on the point, right? This was a session on sort of focused on mentoring, but this doesn't happen in, happen in a vacuum, right? It's There's pieces of recruitment. There's pieces of, you know, this helps through retention. It's pieces of leadership. It's pieces of academia. I think that we're going to hit on here a little bit um, later this afternoon. And I wish, you know, we all live or this is sort of that that tech world, if we could record this and have the words come up in the, you know, those word clouds, I know that makes me old or old school, right? But, but you know, these themes that keep, you know, coming up again around trust and empathy. I've written down comf comfortable confidence, you know, education and, and learning, um, being brave, relational, uh, uh, continuums, collaboration, partnerships. I, I, I mean, I think, I think, you know, Wayne, you alluded to the fact that that this is, you know, that there has been space opened in, in the past year, but but Dennis, the the road was already there, right? But but Chantel's comment that we have to move this from from you know sort of conversation to action and continue to to you know bring this forward and, and be intentional about this and mentorship and, and so many other things. I just I really want to thank you, um, panelists. Uh, this afternoon for these these insights and the personal ones as as well. I I find that you know it it really brings them to life. So um, I think that that with that I think I kind of have to wrap it up before we get cut off and and people move to the next session. But but in having said that, I think I I fell on my most important job of asking you all if if participants are interested here today. Can we keep the chat open and ask? Uh, Chantal and Wayne and Dennis, even either to type it in or in closing, let us know how we can can follow up with you and, and get more information. Uh, it, uh, should you know people want to further engage and continue the cooperation and, and collaboration? Thanks very much. Absolutely. Oh, there Thank we go. You. They're coming through. Yeah. Um, for those, I know you guys are focused on the panel, but there's been some great discussion in the chat. So if you have an opportunity, take a look. Some really great uh, comments about what you guys are talking about today. Perfect. So yeah, everyone can uh, move over to the next uh, session. Um, I, just on the session tab on the left-hand side. Uh, Chantel, Wayne, Leah, great to meet great you. To Thank meet you, you so much. This was just fantastic, Pleasure. folks. I can't Pleasure thank to you meet enough. you, Dennis. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.